Good evening, everyone. Very warm welcome to our service this evening. Whether you're with us online or here in the church, really pleased to have you with us this evening. I'm also very pleased that we have Donny McLeod with us this evening. Donny has preached with us a number of times. He's by, by no means a, a stranger. So, Donny, I want to give you a warm welcome, and we look forward to worshiping God with you this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you for the, the warm welcome, and it is lovely to be here with you on this lovely evening that God has given to us, and it's good to come together to, to worship Him. Our call to worship is from Philippians 2.9. It says, Therefore God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, we do come to you and we thank you that we come to the one who is almighty and who is high and, and holy. We come in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. And so we thank you and praise you that we can come. Thank you that you call us to come. And when we come, we know that your promise is that you are here with us. Your presence is with us. And what a privilege that is to know that we're in the presence of the King of Kings. Help us with our worship, we pray, as we sing your praise and read and meditate upon the word. As we come to the throne of grace in all that we do, we're so conscious of our own weakness but in our weakness, we're cast upon you for strength. And so we thank you. Help us then, and may you be glorified as we gather together in your name. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Our opening praise is that well-known, wonderful old hymn, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Let's stand and sing praises to God together.
Let's join together in, in prayer. Our gracious God, we do indeed thank you that we come to the one who is crowned king of all kings. We thank you, Lord, for the wonder of who you are and of all that you have done. Thank you for this lovely day that you've given to us. Thank you for the beauty of your handiwork that we see and enjoy all around us. We thank you for your faithfulness and your love to us. We can truly say the Lord is good and you have done great things for us whereof we are glad. And we thank you that we are found in this place this evening. There's many other places we could be. But we thank you that you have given a desire in our hearts to come together to worship. And our prayer is that as we gather here together that we would see something anew of who you are. That we would get a fresh glimpse of your greatness and your majesty and your glory. Lord, help us to be focused on, on you and that all distractions would be taken away. We know that even at times like this, especially, are, we can be so easily distracted. But we pray, O oh Lord, that you would protect us and that we would just sense being closed in with yourself. We ask for others gathered like we are this evening. We pray for your word as it goes forth. Thank you for the time here this morning. And as your people gathered around the table of the Lord, we thank you for these times are precious. They're uplifting and a building. They're a source of strength and encouragement to us as we remember the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we thank you for your people who partook of this meal together. We pray, O oh Lord, for any who were observing. We pray, O oh Lord, that they too would get the strength, that they too would find in you their Savior and Lord, and that soon they would take their place at your table with your own people as part of the family of God. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit's power to be at work among us, we live in a, a dark day, a day of great need. And while we look out and we could despair, but yet we mustn't despair because we look to the God of heaven and all things are under your control and there is nothing too hard for the Lord. So we look to your Father in expectancy and praying for the God of heaven to have mercy upon us in our land that we would see once again a day of gospel power, that we would experience the, your truth going forth with power and with authority, and that our, our own lives should be deeply influenced by the word, but not just our own work, lives, but the lives of those round about us. We pray for this community. We pray for people who perhaps don't pray for themselves. And we ask that, they might truly sense their own need, that they might truly see that and understand and know that one day everyone will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. Oh, that we pray that people would realize this and that there'll be a crying out to Almighty God, a crying out for mercy, for forgiveness, that people would be getting right with God putting their hope and their trust in you while they are in the day of grace. Well, we know that that won't always be so. It will get, be too late one day. Lord forbid, draw people to yourself. If you draw people, they'll come. If you turn us, we will turn to you. It's the work of God. And we pray for this work once again in our land. Wilt you not again revive us that we may rejoice in you? Show us, Lord, your covenant mercy, your salvation grant in you. Bless the word going forth, O Lord, this evening that we may gathered like we are and we pray for your servants who will proclaim faithfully your truth 
that they would know a freedom and a liberty in the gospel, that this might be a great evening for the word of God, that it would be a word that would reach deep into the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. We pray for an outpouring of your spirit. We ask you, Lord, for the church plants in the Merck Inch and in Torna Green. Thank you for Chris and the team and for Ennis and the team. Encourage them, Lord, in that work. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would strengthen them and that they might see the, the word impacting lives in those areas. We pray for the many fellowships that are struggling, that are small and struggling throughout the, the highlands and islands. We, we, we pray for just those little struggling congregations and we thank you that you have your people here and there. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would send workers into the harvest field because the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are so few. And so we pray earnestly, the Lord of the harvest, to send workers into the harvest field, that those little congregations could be encouraged because you will send people to them that would be an encouragement and a blessing and a help. Lord, we need workers. And we cry out to you. We pray, O oh Lord, for any who are not well this evening. We ask that you would draw close to them. And that they would know your touch upon their lives. We pray for the elderly and those that are not able to come out anymore. We ask that you would draw close to them and be that little sanctuary to them where they are. Those that are listening online, we pray that they too would sense the power of the Holy Spirit of God moving and working mightily this evening. We pray for our King crowned yesterday. and We ask you, O Lord, for godly wisdom for him. We pray that his hope would be in the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that his trust would be in him, that he would look to the Lord of heaven, the one who rules and reigns over all, that you would draw him, that you would give him wisdom and understanding. O oh Lord, come to those in authority over us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would raise up those who would rule in our land with godly fear and wisdom, that we would see a better day, that we would enjoy Better days ahead. It's righteousness alone that exalts a nation and we pray for this righteousness that would exalt this nation. That things would go well for us because we're looking to you, O oh God. So help us then, we pray. We thank you for this time and we seek your blessing, your encouragement, your strength, that you'd be glorified and honored and that you would cleanse us from sin we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible reading for this evening is from the book of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah, and it's chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple, Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. 
your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. He said, Go and tell this people. Be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away, and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Amen. And we ask that God would bless his word to us. Just a little uh, update about the, the work of the Faith Mission. Thank you for, for praying uh, for the work. And uh, I was think last time I was here, maybe talking about looking for a property for Jeff and Sarah Townend, moving up to the, the area. Well, praise God, uh, an answer has been given and they are now settled into a, a lovely property on the, on the Black Isle, just beside, or very close to the Rosales Church and School. Uh, very, very happy. The, the family there, they have six of a family. Uh, four of them are in school, one's in nursery, and the other one is still too young for that. But uh, they are absolutely loving it. From day one, the kids were really settled well in school. And uh, so we, we just give praise and thanks to God for that. Jeff and Sarah just moved up to the area and they moved up on the Thursday, got settled in a bit on the Friday. On the Saturday, they were away to Orkney running uh, a week of holiday clubs, uh, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And that went really well. And the, the morning club, there was quite a lot of children, 25 or so, and then the afternoon one was a bit smaller. But um, a lady came along with a, a, a daughter, and as far as I know, they, they have been going back to church, and it's good to see uh, God working and moving in these areas as well. Their next trip is away to Tyree, Jeff and a student will be going out there for a week of gospel meetings. And then just the end of May, uh, going out to Point in Lewis to do a tent mission out there, meetings from the 4th to the 18th of June. So we, we value prayer uh, for all of these. Catherine and I are, are, ha are happily retired, whatever that means. And, but we'll be going over, I'll be going over to Point anyway, God willing, to help Jeff with the mission and really looking forward to that. And there's been a lot of prayer has gone into that mission already. And just uh, this evening, the first Sunday of each month, the, there's been a, a prayer time set aside for the mission on the first Sunday of the month in the uh, Garabos Free Church up there. So uh, we, we, we praise God and we look to him for, for fruit for that mission. So thank you again for your fellowship and for your prayers. Uh, for, for the work, and I'm sure you'll continue to support Jeff, and I'm sure you'll, you'll meet him uh, one of these days and get to know him and Sarah a little bit, and that would be really good. We're going to sing again this time. It's a psalm, Psalm 96a. It's in the Sing Psalms. We're going to sing verses 1 to 10. We'll sing a new song to the Lord. Sing praises to his name and his salvation day by day. Let all the earth Proclaim. Let's stand and sing, please.
Let's pray before we come to the word. Lord, we, we bow before you, we bow humbly, seeking your face, seeking your strength and your help. We, we, we need the help of God in all that we do, especially when we turn to your word. We pray that you would make your word a, a living word to our hearts that we would experience something afresh of your greatness, of your glory. That we would see a, a new vision of Jesus, a view that we've not seen here before. As we come in your presence, we look to your Father. Encourage us, lift us up. Our eyes are towards you as we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I want to look back at this a chapter that we've read together from God's Word. And in Isaiah chapter 6, and the first verse of this chapter says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I saw the Lord. Charles Colson, who founded the, the Prison Fellowship, visited a friend, Tom Phillips, and this friend explained that to him that he had just accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Colson could see that Tom was at peace with himself and with God. And that had a great influence, a profound influence upon his life. At that time, Charles Colson was not a converted man. And he, he was influenced so much by the testimony of this man, Tom Phillips, that when he got out and he got to his car, he was crying so much, he couldn't get his keys into, into the lock, into the ignition of the car. At that time, he was confronted with his own sin, the hidden evil that lives within every human heart. And it was painful, and he couldn't escape. He cried out to God and found himself driven into his waiting arms. That night, he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ and began the greatest adventure of his life. That was a wonderful experience for him uh, through the influence and the testimony of Tom Phillips. But he goes on to, to, to write, and I read this, and I'm quoting more or less as word for word. He was willing to cry in 1973. This was when he was converted, when he, he was confronted with his own sin, and he, he found himself driven to the, to the Savior, but also to repent several years later of his very inad inadequate view of his God. Similarly, he watched lectures on the holiness of God by R.C. Sproul, and at the end of the sixth lecture, he was on his knees deep in prayer in awe of a God of absolute holiness. He gained at that time a new understanding and a taste for the majesty of God, an experience that he would never forget. And there are these experiences in the life of God's people that are unforgettable experiences, and that's what we're, we're looking at here tonight in, the, in Isaiah. He said, in the year that King Josiah died, I saw the Lord. He remembered it because it was in that year that that's when this vision took place. Kings rise and kings fall. But God is on the throne and he'll always be on the throne. And that should be a great comfort and that should bring a great confidence to us. The theme of this chapter is really divine kingship. We've been watching and, and hearing a lot about uh, king Charles III and a king being crowned. But here is the king of kings 
divine kingship. You know, there are many times in Scripture we, we, we read and, and we know of them, don't we? When people had encounters with the Lord. We just read about this when there's Samuel, for example. In 1 Samuel 3.20, all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Verse 21 says, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. We read in Acts 7 2 uh, about Abraham. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham, Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. These times when God revealed himself to his people in, in many different ways. Paul himself, on the road to Damascus, met with, with, with the, the Lord himself. Uh, with the, the light so bright, his, his glory shining so bright that he could do nothing else but fall down before him. Memorable times. Times never to be forgotten. Sure, there's people here and that you've had experiences, you've had times in your lives when you, when, and you will never forget them. And they're memorable. In John 12, 41, we read Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. What may he have seen when he said he saw his glory? It's quite a difficult concept for us to grasp because the glory of God is just so much greater than where, where our minds could, could take us. It's just so much greater, his glory. I found help from uh, some commentaries, Baker's commentary, for example. He took us to, to John 1 and 14, where it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. He explained it like this. He said, It's the radiance of his grace and the majesty of his truth manifested in all his works and words. The radiance of his grace and the majesty of his truth shone forth in all his works and words. The attributes of his deity shining through the veil of his human nature. And that's a quote. In John 2.11 we read the first of the signs that Jesus did. Remember it, don't we, in the wedding in Cana in Galilee. And we read that he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. I remember speaking to uh, the Reverend William McLeod up in Barvis who had lived through the Lewis re Revival and on the subject of the glory of God. And speaking about this parable, when Jesus turned the water, when the wine ran out, and Jesus turned the water into wine. This is what William said, what was human, ran out. And it will bring disappointment. But when they saw his glory, it surpassed everything that went before the glory of God from the fullness from his fullness we have received grace upon grace from the law was given through Moses the law was given through Moses grace and truth came through Jesus Christ no one has ever seen God the only God who is at the father's side he has made him known perfectly holy set apart because that's what holiness is isn't it it's been been set apart, set apart from what, from what contaminates, set apart from what's secular. John Piper explained the glory of the going public 
of his holiness. The seraphim, the, we, we read, with six wings they called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. Wonder when we, when we think about or try to grasp something, a little of the, just the splendor and the glory of the king manifested in all his works and words. Do, do we have a longing in our hearts for just a, a glimpse of this glory? You know, if we, if we could see afresh something of the greatness and of the glory, the, the holiness of God, it would without doubt do something for us. It would without doubt change, change us. It would show us anew, for one thing, the seriousness of sin. Because if we get a glimpse of his holiness, set apart perfectly holiness, if we get, get, a, get a glimpse of him and his glory, it would show us the seriousness of sin. And surely, friends, is it not true that we live, live in a day when sin is not seen as serious as it should be. It's not taken to be as serious as it should be. And probably that has crept into all of our lives in some shape or form. But certainly in the world today, it's like people are just going on without any thought or without any consideration. Th that sin is serious and God cannot tolerate sin because he's holy, holy, holy. And are people not going on as if there's no accountability? That there'll be no sense that everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account one day? You know, a glimpse of him would show us afresh the seriousness of sin. He is holy. Wonderful and an unforgettable experience I say I had. He remembered it. It was in that year. He said, I saw the Lord. When you speak to people that have had experiences like that, and I suppose when we think of times of re revival and if we've been in the company of people that have lived through revival, they, they will be able to tell of many experiences like that. They, 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 will, they will tell of times when, when God came down in power. And so often they say, I will never forget it. I remember being told, I've been told a lot of stories by Lady Agnes Morrison in Shadder. And she was telling one evening during the revival in the Barvis Church that they, after the, the service, she said they were just all leaving slowly, making their way out of the church slowly and quietly. And she says, I remember it well. We were just about the steps going out the door. And then she said, God came down and everyone stopped and one of the men began singing of course it was in Gaelic words from Psalm 132 I will not enter my house or get into my bed I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. And she would say, there were many times like that. It was wonderful. We, we were living outside of revival. We come to the same God, don't we? The God of glory. The God who's majestic and magnificent. 
And do we have that desire, that longing? When we come together, do we, 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 we come with an expectancy? When we come together in his house, do we prayerfully think, Lord, that as we come around your word, as we sing your praises, may we see something afresh of you, of your glory. Because we would leave different from what we come in to see something of what I say is so. In that year he said, I saw the Lord. And the train of his robe filled the temple. The hem or the bottom of the robe of a king or priest. His kingly reign, he is king. And of course, we are those who know Jesus Christ as Savior. Those who are his children are, 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 are his temples. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? To be filled with the Spirit of God. Surely we should have a longing for him more and more. He saw his glory. He saw his splendor. He saw his majesty. And he was overwhelmed by it. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings and two. He covered his face and with two he covered his feet and with two he flew. Covered his face. Surely a sign of, of, of reverence. Careful how we come before the king. Is that not something that's lacking today as well? Just that sense of reverence for God. Because we come before him who's all glorious and holy. We're in his presence. Even the seraphim covered their faces. Humility. With two he flew, the wings, with two he flew, working for God on God's errands, if we like. They called to each other, they praised God that we might see through, through the eye of faith the Lord afresh. We would say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Oh, to see that afresh, wouldn't it be wonderful? Do we expect to see his glory? Or we think, oh no, that's what happened years ago. That doesn't happen today. Well, we should always expect it. We should always look to him that we would see a fresh glimpse. We want to see what it did for Isaiah, a fresh vision of the king. I saw the Lord. It was unforgettable. It came to him with an overwhelming sense of his presence and of his power. What do we look for when we come together? You know, if we could get a glimpse of what he saw, I saw the Lord. It would make an impact upon us. Because we would look to him more. We would have a greater love for him. And we would have a greater love for each other. Oh, that Christ would be revealed, that we would see him afresh. When John 12, 20 and 21, it says, Now those went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. Among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Uh, do you have a longing? 
Surely we're not just satisfied that we can keep coming. And it's good to come to church. It's wonderful. But don't you have a longing that we wouldn't just come and go and leave virtually the same? Because we're in the presence of the king. That we would see him, see his glory, his holiness. Like he revealed himself to the woman at the well. She said, I know that when Messiah is, the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I will speak to you, am he? Just then, the, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? See, an encounter with Christ, when he revealed himself to her, what was earthly was left behind. And she went and spoke of him. She's saying to the people, come, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. See, when Isaiah had a vision of the Lord, what he realized, he was unclean. He said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Unclean here is a general term in the Old Testament for all that is unfit to be in the presence of God. And this is what a glimpse of the Lord will do. It shows us in our lives what's not right. It shows us and will show us our sin. Shows us things that we otherwise would not see. You see, we can just go on, can't we? We can go on day by day. But a meeting, an encounter with the king, uh, a fresh vision of him will show us in our lives what's not right. Isaiah said, woe is me, for I am lost, I am undone, I am ruined. You see, what he saw, he saw the Lord. When he saw the Lord, he realized he was unclean. But what it required was cleansing. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his, in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The cleansing coal taken from the altar that was burning constantly, not to burn, but to cleanse and to heal. And surely this is a picture of the cross that must take us to Calvary, where there is forgiveness, for there is cleansing that our sin can be atoned for by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that cleanses and goes on cleansing from all sin. You see, surely that's where a glimpse of the Savior would, would take us to. We would flee afresh to the cross for forgiveness because when we got a, French, a fresh glimpse of his glory, of his holiness, it would show us ourselves what we're like as it did for Isaiah. And we would go afresh to the cross for forgiveness, for cleansing, for healing. That's what happens when the word of God is applied to our hearts. And not just it touched his lips, but it has to, to come to our hearts, doesn't it? This word that we would flee to Christ. Psalm 130 says, O Lord, if you should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? If we were called to account for our sin, in other words, no one could stand except for the next line when it says, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. You see, he saw the Lord in that vision, he realized he was unclean. He knew he needed cleansing. 
but he also came to a place of surrender. When he says, Who, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send in verse 8, and who will go for us? And he said, Here I am, send me. What a change. We, we, We can see that, can't we? Because he's not long finished saying he's ruined. He's undone. His sin was before him. He speaks of failure and unclean and not fit for purpose to saying, here I am. Send me. Having a boldness and a freedom through through trust through the cleansing of the precious blood, through a renewed trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, through the filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Makes us ready for service. And this boldness doesn't come from him. And it will never come from ourselves. But it came through an an encounter with the living God. And there's nothing of him, but he realizes that his strength It's all in in Christ, in the Lord himself. And that's what made the difference. It was a meeting with the king and a deep cleansing of the heart by the blood of Christ, The, the pardoning grace that brings a spirit of freedom. Here I am, send me. What a wonderful line that is. That there be a willing people You know, we'll only be a willing people fit for service if we have an encounters with the king, if we we stand right before him. Send me to what? You see, here I am, send me. Mightn't be an easy task. But when God calls us to serve him, it's to whatever. There's no buts in the call of God. Lord, I'm willing to do this, but don't send me there. Don't ask me to speak to that person. No, no, that's not the call of God. The call of God upon the lives of his people is, here I am, send me to do whatever you want me to do. To do whatever. Because, you know, God is never unreasonable. And God's way is perfect. And you cannot improve on perfect and neither can I. So when God leads us, when God gives us a task, it's perfect. It's right. It'll be right for you. And it'll be right for me. He just needs people to say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Is somebody perhaps sensing the call of God? Here I am, send me obedience to the kingship of the Lord. Just in closing, a little story. There's a horseman rode out into the night with his horse and and carriage. He was really wanting to get a proper view of the night sky, the stars and how wonderful and beautiful they look so He rode out into a forest area and he went out so far and there was a clearing and he stopped and he looked up but he couldn't see the night sky. But he went to the carriage and he snuffed out out all the lights that were shining round about the carriage till there was darkness. And then he looked up and he could see the night sky clearly. I wonder, are there things in our lives that are hindering our view of Jesus? Things that need to be dealt with, that need to be snuffed out, as it were. Because they'll hinder your view and they'll hinder my view of what we should really be seeing. You know, I say, I said in that year, I saw the Lord. 
whatever it might be. Secret sin. Could be a wrong relationship. Could be a critical spirit. A critical spirit never ends up well. It's grown cold, a coldness of heart. It's hindering your view of him. We need to see him in this day that we live in. We have lost ground spiritually because we're not seeing him as we should. I say I was sent to bring a hard message to a people that did not want to listen, a rebellious people. But he still had to go. He still had to go and tell. That's what we are commissioned to do. That's what Ministers of the gospel are commissioned to do. That's what evangelists are commissioned to do. That's what all of us are commissioned to do in some way or another. Just to go and tell. And allow God to do his work. But you know to do that. We need the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. He whose hands are clean and whose heart is pure will ascend the hill of the Lord. In Psalm 101, I think it is, it says, He whose walk is blameless will minister to me. May God help us. As I was watching the, I didn't watch a lot of it, I was few things to do yesterday. I watched some of the highlights of the coronation last night. And not everybody was happy about it. There's lots of good things and amazing things. But then there was the protesters. And they were shouting, not my king, not my king. There's many people shouting that today, and that's what the, the Jewish people shouted. They said, we will not have this man to, to rule over us, away with him, crucify him. I hope in your heart tonight you, you're not saying, not my king. If you've never known Jesus, you could start the greatest adventure of your life tonight by saying, yes, my king. Jesus, come into my life and be my savior. Wash me from all my sin. That we would see him and see his greatness. Maybe all of us, myself included, we need a fresh glimpse of him, of his greatness of his glory that we might leave a willing people to serve him, washed and cleansed afresh in his own precious blood for his glory. Lord, we pray that you would help us. Help us to get a fresh glimpse of you, Lord. Forgive us for our coldness. Forgive us, Lord, for our thoughts, our attitudes, our desires have not been what they should be. But we want to be a people showing forth the Lord Jesus Christ to this dying and dark world. That we would be like stars in the universe showing forth the love of Christ. But we can only do that when we've been in the presence of the King that we would see a glimpse of you, Lord, to show us our own need, that we would be found fleeing to the cross of Calvary for a fresh cleansing, that we might go forward, that we might be a people 
who would ascend the hill of the Lord. O oh Lord, grant it, we pray. Make us effective for you, that in our own weakness we would know your strength. Help us, we pray. As we sing our closing praise, may the praise from our hearts sound to, to, up to you, Lord, as we sing of the King of glory, that he would enter in, come to every heart, we pray. Cleanse us afresh, that you would have all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing our closing praise, and it's Psalm 24 from the Scottish Psalter, verses 7 to 10. Ye gates lift up your heads on high, ye doors that last for aye be lifted up, that so the King of glory enter may. We'll stand and sing these verses together, please. The, the benediction of blessing. It's a hymn by Vernon Hyam, a Welsh preacher. He says, I saw a new vision of Jesus, a view I'd not seen here before, beholding in glory so wondrous, with beauty I had to adore. I stood on the shores of my weakness and gazed at the brink of such fear. "'Twas then that I saw him in newness, regarding him fair and so dear.'"
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.